Our spiritual care ministry extends help to those walking through difficult times. Our trained peer discipleship team members can address various concerns, including spiritual, relational, grief, financial, or helping you find your next best step at Grace. We use prayer, mentoring, coaching, guidance, and professional referrals as tools of care. Our ministry is free, short-term, biblically-based, and confidential. We are not professional counselors. Referrals are given as needed. If you'd like more information regarding spiritual care, visit graceoc.com and click connect. All right, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for the clapping. Wow, that just really helps my self-esteem for the rest of the day. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is Jim Berenger. I get to be the lead pastor here at our Washingtonville location. Welcome all of our guests. Welcome all of you joining us online as well. Here in the room, you're going to see a camera roaming around the room. That's just to help our online audience connect as well as they're joining us for worship today. If you're a guest, welcome to Grace. We're so glad that you ended up here. And I don't know if that's been a struggle or if that's been easy for you or whatever place you find yourself today. We're glad that you ended up here with us at Grace. And we say you are a gift to us. I hope you just feel like our honored guests while you're here joining us. And what we like to do is we like to help you get connected, feel a part of what's going on here. So we need a little bit of information from you. If you look at the seat back in front of you, there's a card or a code you can scan. Or if you join us online, a button you can push. Either way, what we do with that information, we just start the conversation. Hey, how can we help you get connected? And then we'll also donate to a local charity in your name. Just the way we say, hey, thank you again for making us the priority. Two other things we'll say, and we'll say them over and over again. I hope you understand why they're important that people hear them. We say here it's okay to not be okay. And maybe you're walking in today and you're, you're sitting there in the chair and you're feeling heavy or even overwhelmed by circumstances around you. I want to let you know you're in a good place here at Grace. It's okay to not be okay. We just hope you don't want to stay not okay. We're going to love you enough here to tell you the truth. And over my years, I've been thankful for the people willing to tell me the truth. And what do we talk about when we talk about the truth? We talk about God's word. That book in the seat backs in front of you, we believe is God's word. It's life changing truth. So every weekend, we're faithful. We share that truth in love with you while you're here at Grace. Once again, welcome. Hey, today's going to be wonderful. I know it is. It's going to be a great experience. I think it might even be powerful in your life today. But what about after today? What about a next step? And so we encourage you to start asking that question even now as you're, you're sitting in your chairs. Uh, what might be my next step? Maybe it's plugging into a ministry. Maybe it's, it's getting plugged into something like spiritual care. Help you out of an unstuck place in your life. So graceoc.com slash next steps. You can start figuring out what might be your next step. The last I would say about the service is that we won't pass an offering plate. When people give at Grace. And when they give towards the mission and ministry of grace, they're giving not out of guilt, but they are giving out of gratitude. We say out of the overflow of what God is doing in our lives. So when people are ready to start giving as part of their worship, uh, here in this room, there's some giving boxes by each exit door, or you can give online through our website, graceoc.com. Our worship team's gonna lead us now to our God who is worthy of our worship. As they do that, you're gonna see words come up on the screen. I invite you, join along, sing as we praise God who is worthy of our worship. Let's stand and praise him now. Thanks, Pastor Jim. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grace. My name is Anya, and all of us on team, we're so excited and blessed to lead you all in worship this morning. Let's raise his name on high and give him the praise he deserves. Amen. Open what blinded eyes, giants fall, dead men rise, sickness healed at the mention of you. Sinners change.
that holy name, the name above all, that of King Jesus. He has given us the gift of new life. He is our redemption, our salvation, our protector and our champion. And I hope you'll declare that with us today. us this time of worship. God, thank you for the gift of eternal life. We are all undeserving people, and yet you give us the promise of redemption. We were orphaned, and you adopted us as your own. Lord, I ask that you bless the sermon, that you bless our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our mind to your word, Lord. Thank you for your love and for your grace and your mercy, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can all take a seat.
All right, what's up, everybody? Thanks for coming out. <clears throat> Great to see y'all. Welcome to everybody online and at our campuses. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jared. Have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor. No, they These log, wonderful people known as Grace. Name, it means so much that you're here with us as we launch into a series called In Focus, as we're really focusing on what God calls us to focus on in Christ in some specific areas of our lives. So let me pray and we'll, we'll dig in. <clears throat> So, Lord, we gather together, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you will speak to every individual heart in the unique way that they know it is your voice talking to them and not the voice of a man. I pray, Holy Spirit, be our ultimate teacher, our counselor, our guide. Open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word. I plead it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Came across a story a while back about this kid that he was a part of a play that was being put on. And the director put him in the, in, the, in the top to operate the spotlight, kind of like God of the play there, his spotlight. And there was one day they were putting on the show, and he goes up to the director, and he says to the director, listen, I don't think I can work the spotlight today. I feel, I feel too crazy to be God today. And I thought a lot about that, and I thought how we never are no more crazy or stressed or anxious or fearful than when we play God in our lives. And you know how you can truly know when you're playing God in your life? You don't pray. Prayer is when you say, I am not God of my life. And when I've played God, I have felt a bit crazy or anxious or stressed or worrisome or afraid. And so I pray to say, God, no, you are God, not me. And my eyes are on you. So that's where Jesus takes us today in terms of prayer, the Lord's prayer. And he teaches us not what to pray, but how to pray. So let's see what he says here. We'll read this through and, and then come back and walk through it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So what we're going to see is that when, when Jesus taught us this prayer to focus in on prayer and God himself, there are the first three concerns that have to do with God's concerns. And then the last three have to do with our concerns. And Jesus is saying, this then is how you pray. First, it's God's concerns, and then it goes to your concerns. So let's take a journey together. First of all, when we pray, first according to God's concerns, that we pray in relationship. <clears throat> we pray in relationship with God. How does this look? Matthew 6, 9. Our Father. Our Father. That's how Jesus begins this. Jesus doesn't say my Father as if it's only his Father. He's saying, no, all of us. This is your father too. 13 times in the Old Testament, we see God named as father, but father in a transcendent sense, like the father of nations. But then we get to Jesus, and Jesus is called a blasphemer and a heretic because of this, because he says, my father, and he does so 150 times. And Jesus says to you and me, that's how we get to pray, as if he's our father, because he is our father as well. <clears throat> the father's heart. <clears throat> when I talk about father, I wonder what comes to your mind. If you think of a, a, a father who is distant from you, uh, abandoned you there, but not really paying attention to you, or you just can't please him no matter what you do, what do we do with this? This is why we focus on the true father of heaven and earth. We see first when the father says to Jesus himself, before Jesus ever did a miracle, before Jesus ever did any ministry, <clears throat> he said to Jesus, you are my son with whom I am, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So in Christ, God looks to you and says, you don't have to please me in the sense of to be, to be close to me. He's saying, I am pleased with you. In Christ, you are my beloved. That's the heart of your father. But then there's this other heart of the, this, this other side of the father's heart that Jesus shows us in a par parable about the prodigal son. <clears throat> this is when a, the son goes to his father and says, Father, I wish you were dead. Give me my money that's due to me 
with my inheritance after you die. That's pretty jolting words to the father, but the father gives him what he wants and off he goes. And the parable goes on to say that he spent all this money on women and wild living. Then it says he came to his senses empty and decides I'm going back home. But on the way home, he's expecting to meet a father that is that is not going to accept him. And so you read the parable and he does this mantra in his mind about what he's going to say to the father. Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me out as your hired servant. And he repeats that thinking maybe his father will take it easy on him if he comes with that kind of attitude. And the parable ends by the father seeing the son at a distance as if the father had been praying and hoping and waiting for his son to come back no matter what he had done. And the father jumps off the porch, runs to the son, and it says he embraces him and he kisses him. And the original language means, and he kissed him again, and he kissed him again, and he kissed him again, and he kissed him again. And he said, you are my son. You were once dead, now you are alive. You were once lost, but now you're found. That's the heart of your father. When you think you've gone too far, oh, you've done it now, and you've out his love in some way. No, no, there is a father who welcomes you home and doesn't just welcome you home, but pulls up the robe, leaps off the porch, and runs for you Amen. and embraces you and kisses you. See, maybe that's not the view of the father. I'll tell you what my view of the father used to be. Oh, yeah, he would jump off the porch and run to me, but as soon as he got to me, he would <laughs> slap me to the ground. Anybody's view of their father like that? The, the view of the father like that? Or if not that extreme, it was the father who leapt off the porch, run down and put his finger in my face and said, how dare you? Told you so. But that's not the father we see. Our father is a father who runs with tears in his eyes and embraces you when you come back home. So maybe prayer begins this way. Come home. Who needs to come home today? The father welcomes you and he kisses you again and again and again. The, affec- the affection of the Father. First John chapter 3, verse 1, the apostle picks it up by saying, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. So when you become a child of God, you are a child because of the words of Scripture called adoption. Not everybody is God's child. Some people say, well, everybody's God's children. No, they're not. The letter of Acts says there are, there's God's offspring, but only God's children are those who have placed their faith in Christ and are born again. And now you are no longer an orphan, but you are called a child because he's adopted you. And adoption, we adopted our two girls. Adoption means behind it all, he chose you. You go to an orphanage, you see all these children, you want to adopt them all for your own. Well, we chose our girls is, is ours. We said, you're, you're mine. In the same way, when you place faith in Christ behind the scenes, he said, oh, yeah, but I chose you as my child. The Father, he's yours and you are his. What a, what a glory that you get to be his and be close to him and near to him and near to his heart. Speaking of that, our daughter, Jubilee, our little Jubilee, we adopted. She did this craft at school about her role model. Here's what she wrote. She said, my role model is Pastor Jared. (laughs) But then she does turn it into dad. So why is Pastor Jared my dad, her role model? She goes, well, he always puts on a TV show for me. He helped me when I got upset. He showed smarts. (laughs) He taught me how to clean. (laughs) And he's special to me because I love him. That's my daughter. How about that? But see, that's what, that's what comes into your heart and your mind when you pray to your father. You bring these things to mind. You're my dad because you, you, you've done these things for me. You've taught me. You've helped me. You've shown me your goodness. You're special to me because you've made me special to you. That's what you do when you pray, our father, my father who is in heaven. So you pray in relationship. Do you have the right view of the Father when you pray? Secondly, pray in relationship, then pray in reverence. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So heaven, hallowed be your name, all this centers around reverence or, or, or respect. So Father in heaven, 
there always ought to be something about the father that brings out respect. So let me give you an example. It's, it's like a child who has a dad and let me take my family. So my dad, when I was growing up, he, for our fireplace, he would go out and saw wood. So we'd go out together and to be a little boy, knowing I'm loved by my father, to see him with those same hands in which he loved me, take a big chainsaw and rev it up and cut down a big tree and then to saw that saw the limbs off and then saw that tree in the sections and then to stand those big logs up and take them all and split the, the wood and it would fly. I mean, I know I'm loved my, by my father, but whoa, my father's strong and he's powerful. See, when you pray to the father who is in heaven, there ought to be a whoa in you as well because he's in heaven. Heaven meaning he's almighty. He's all powerful. He's sovereign over all. That's, that's always blown my mind about God is that he is sovereign. He's in control of it all. Even when his oceans of wisdom don't fit my little teacup brain, he's good and he's father and he's in control. And that's where we ought to have reverence and awe because often what we just see is a moment. We don't understand the billions of things God is up to around us. So th think of a lightning flash. Whenever a lightning flashes, you just see the flash. You don't see the rest of it. There's all kinds of matters going around. So we only see the flash, but God has his plan and connections and network. All that, God is weaving all of that for your good, according to his purposes for your life. So there ought to be an awe, reverence, a whoa, that God is sovereign in ways I can't even comprehend. Then he says, hallowed be your name. Name, holy is your name. Holy means to be set apart. It means not common. Do not treat as common his name. His name first has to do with character. So we see God's name in that he is most high. He is everlasting. He is the provider. He's the fighter. He's peace. He's the shepherd. He's the one who is present. He is the one who sees me. He's, his name is wonderful. So that's his character. Also his power. His name means his power. We pro he himself proclaims his own name and we call on his name. Salvation is through his name. We gather in his name. We pray in his name. We suffer for his name. We confess his name. We bear his name and we don't profane his name. So can I, can I get a little close to you right here? Can we, can we do something as Christians? Can we drop the phrase, oh my God? Does that pinch a little bit? I want to call us to us being children of the Father in which we ought to go, whoa. Can we also do away with OMG? Because what happens when we, as Christians, OMG or oh my God? What have we done? We've taken God's holy name and made it common. Taken God's holy name and we've just made it every day. And it's like dragging his name through the mud. We ought to have a we ought to pray in respect and reverence and whoa. He's our father, but whoa, and you are set apart. You are not common. You are God. So that's the way you pray. You pray in relationship. You pray in reverence. And then thirdly, you pray in surrender. Pray in surrender. Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. So what does it mean for the kingdom, his kingdom to come? Well, we live in a day in a culture of lies and deception and rebellion and the demonic. So for God's kingdom to come, it first comes in and through you and me. First, it's in you and me. Jesus, Jesus talked about how the kingdom is within you. What does that mean? If you go back to the Beatitudes, the series we did, it talked about being peacemakers. It talked about being meek, meaning we would strain our strength for the good of others. He talked about being merciful. We have compassion for the least, last, lonely, and uh, so forth. And so it's to have that within us. But it's also the future of his kingdom that comes. The future of, when's the last time you prayed this? The future of the kingdom we prayed down, in which that kingdom means no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. For the old things have passed away and the new has come, for God is with his people. Boy, that's some... Get some praying behind that. 
When's the last time you prayed? And I say you, I'm asking me too. When's the last time you prayed the final words of Revelation when he said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's praying the kingdom now. Are you praying? Are we praying in surrender that, Lord, we, want, we don't want to play God. We want you to come be God in and through us and bringing your kingdom to us. Your kingdom, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what's going on in heaven? In heaven, there's truth. In heaven, there's life. There's light. In, in heaven, there's joy that would pierce our souls to experience it in these bodies and on, in this world. And there's also angels who are doing the will of God. What do angels do? Angels are at the father's or the king, actually the king's command. They gather, they worship, they sing, they shout, they serve, they obey, they protect. They're answers to prayer for God. They're messengers of God. So in the same way, his will in heaven is that we gather and we sing and we shout and we worship and we protect the vulnerable and we and we bring truth to bear. We are mes messengers of peace. We, and so forth and so on, like the angels of heaven on earth as it is in heaven, to do that on the earth, to be like the angels. And what do the angels ultimately say to the king? What are we to say to the king? Command me. Every morning on our knees, command me. And I learned this a while back. I love this. You know, when you say command me, it's you surrendering your life. It's not committing your life. So if someone on the street put a gun to you and said, give me your wallet, you wouldn't commit your wallet to them. You'd surrender it. You'd surrender it, hands off all yours. That's surrender. Lord Jesus, Father, command me. I surrender it, hands off all yours. That's the will of God in heaven being done on earth, in you and through you, in me and through me. Some specific texts of how that might look. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? He, didn't, he doesn't start by saying, obey always. He starts by saying, rejoice always. You have the kingdom within you. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. If you're wondering, what's God's will for my life? Start right there. And he'll work out the rest, like the lightning bolt in the, in the offshoots there. He's, he'll take care of the rest. Just be about his concerns. Then there's Romans 12, 1. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and his pleasing and his perfect will. So conform means to be shaped, to be molded by something, like the hands on a piece of clay. What are you being molded by today? What, do, what have you listened to? What have you believed out there in the culture or in mass media or on TikTok? What are you believing that's shaping you, shaping your mind? He's talking about the mind. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, caterpillar to butterfly. It may get dark for a while. It may be a struggle, but beauty is coming. You will have wings to fly. Be transformed by the renewing. Literally, it means renovation, the renovating of your mind. I need a lot of renovating in my mind throughout the day and the week. I think you do as well. A renovation of shame and guilt, a renovation of sin, a renovation of lusts, a renovation of tearing all of that out for God to build a newness in you. And then as you experience that, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and his pleasing, his perfect will. God's will is found in his word, and it's you being conformed and molded and shaped by his word. So that means when you read his word, understand you don't have authority over his word. He has authority over you. My, my friend, Pastor Trebellis, says we all read the Bible with two, one of two things, a highlighter or a sharpie. A highlighter to mark the things we like, and then a sharpie to write out, to mark out what we don't. So to know God's will, it is to be conformed to the molding and shaping of his will. And you pray for that. You pray and surrender. I, I surrender myself, my mind, my will to yours. So pray and surrender. That's God's concerns. It's to pray in relationship. It's to pray in reverence. It's to pray and surrender. And now the Lord's about your concerns as well. Pray for needs. Pray for your needs. Matthew 6, verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. 
That word daily literally means every day. So give us today our everyday bread. Now, every time I see the word bread recently, I think of the Texas Roadhouse rolls. Anybody? <laughs> my word, my word. If you ever want to know if God exists, eat those rolls, y'all. He is good, all right? That's what I think about. Uh, my son calls it T-Roadie, T-Roadie house. So the, but, but he's not talking about bread. He's talking about everyday needs. And I jotted down a few things about the, the needs, the little minute needs that we tend to even forget about, like just food and healthy food and shelter and maintenance that we need and things of our lives, your clothes, your transportation, your education, marriage, family, your work or without work or your insurance or your health, all of these things and more are everyday needs. So what that means is he's saying to pray for the Father to meet those needs. Therefore, Jesus wants us to get that God is not our plan B. No wonder we tend to go crazy and get stressed and anxious and fearful because God's plan B. When we feel the, the desperation, when Jesus is saying, no, 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 he's plan A always. Every morning you wake up, needs, my God, my Father. I have needs today. And Jesus says, lay them out there. Lay out those needs and let, let the Lord hear as you put those before him. Because he's a giver. He's a giver. Give us today. Give me the ability today. Give me health today. And then whatever, whatever you have in your life, even if you tend to meet your own needs, like many of us do, we meet our own needs and God ends up being a plan B. We're to remember that Deuteronomy chapter 8 says that God calls us to never forget to the sense that we have needs met or luxuries in our lives and say, it is by my power and my might that I accomplished this. And God says, don't ever forget that I'm the one that gave you the might and the power to have it. And so if you ever get to the point, no, it's me that did it. Oh, you're playing God again. And now success is going to go to your head or failure is going to go to your heart. So you go to the Father who's a giver with those needs today, every day, these everyday needs, whether it's finances or whether it, you're exhausted and you don't know how you're going to make it tomorrow. No, don't worry about tomorrow. Just when you wake up in the morning, pray simply to the Father, your needs. You know, if Jesus gave us this prayer and he, and he told us to pray these words, give us today our everyday bread, our everyday needs, wouldn't that then mean that God's willing to answer? That God wants to answer it if Jesus, after all, said pray it? So pray with joy, pray with expectation to your Father who is in heaven. So pray for needs, then pray for forgiveness. Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts... Don't you wish it ended there? <laughs> and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So that word debts is interesting because Jesus implies that we are in debt to God. He gave us life. He gave us breath. We are created for him. Any means we have is a gift from him. But in our hearts, before Christ and at times even in Christ, we tend to play God. We make God out in our own image we rebel against him. We have a sinful nature toward him. We, make, we, we, get, we have spirituality and without some God sprinkled in or we only turn to him in crisis or we just want enough of him that we don't need him. All of that is sin and all that is debt toward God. And we're to understand that and to know, though, that when Christ came, he came that through faith in him, we would be forgiven those debts because he took that infinite debt on the cross, died with it there, rose again, and through faith we are made right with God, debt paid. The word to be forgiven in the sense means to be sent away, to be erased, to be swept away forever. You're forgiven and your shame and guilt is removed as far as the east is from the west. And I've always loved that picture, not from north to south because there's a north pole and a south pole, east and west, meaning it has no end. God has swept it away forever. That is glorious. Here's the way to think about it. So, you know, of course, Chris and I, we have a mortgage on our home. And this one day we got a letter from the mortgage company and we opened it up. And, you know, you kind of skip past all the writing to see what the balance is. 
So I skipped past all the writing and I looked down and it said what the debt we owed was zero. And I stared at that and I stared at that and I looked up and I said, could it be, Lord? Did you just do a miracle in our lives? And I called Christy up. We stared at the zero and we stared at the zero and we thought, it has been paid. We are free. And then we read the letter and it had been transferred to another mortgage company. And then the reality set in, oh, it was too good to be true. But see that moment that we had as, could it be forgiven, swept away forever? See, that is the truth in Christ Jesus. Whatever you've done, wherever you've come from, Jesus took your mortgage toward God of sin and debt, and he died with it, paid in full. You know, when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, you know what it is finished means? Paid in full. That's what you have in Christ. So though we owe God, Jesus said, you owe, but I'll pay. You owe, but I'll pay. And he paid for our sin on the cross. That is worth, that's worth clapping for, Yes. Oh, but the applause is going to get quiet now because as we also have forgiven our debtors, mm, how you doing? This is the call. And it's, it's the call of this, that we forgive others not to be forgiven, but because you are forgiven. It's to lead your life with a spirit of forgiveness. You lead that way. Because Jesus ends the Lord's Prayer in this section with this, Matthew 6, 14. If, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What do we do with this? Well, first, it can't be that we've got to forgive in order to be saved. Because Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are saved by grace, not by our works. So that can't be what it means. Even Jesus says that in him we're already purified. So what does it mean then? It has to mean this. If you or I don't forgive, it's a red flag that we're saved. If you and I don't forgive, there's a red flag that we've been forgiven meaning that we're not really saved. It's, it's, a, it's a spotlight that something's off. So it's forgiving that gives you and I our own proof that, yeah, this is, this is because of the forgiveness by the perfect Father that's overflowing out of me. And that's a tough one to, to get. But that is the call. That is what happens. Where Jesus, in the same way that Jesus said it, we say it. We look at someone who has not just committed a slight against us. There are things we can forgive. This slight, that slight, ah, uh, okay. But there are the ones that are crushing. What about those? Well, even there, Jesus would say to be like him in this, you owe, I'll pay. You owe me, but I'll pay. I forgive you. Isn't that agony? Isn't that like a death? Sounds like the cross, doesn't it? So when Jesus died to forgive you and me, he did it in agony. He did it in suffering. But he was resurrected, and so shall you be. When you forgive as you have been forgiven in the Lord. So let me ask you a question. Who right now in your life must you forgive? Whoever you most do not want to forgive is the very one you should. Because of what God's forgiven you for and me for. Yeah. So we pray for this forgiveness in our lives. And always remember, oftentimes, if not every time, the forgiveness is more for you than them. I read this years ago, that when you don't forgive someone, it's like you taking poison and hoping they die. So it's forgiven. See how Jesus is for your freedom and your wholeness? So you pray for forgiveness. It's kind of the I'm sorry's father. Not that you got to be forgiven so that you're saved again. It's the I'm sorry's. I don't want to hurt your heart. I don't want to offend you. And then to forgive as well. So pray for your needs. 
your concerns. Pray for forgiveness, your concerns, and then pray for protection. Matthew 6, 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Notice in this one, it's not pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, what do we do with this? Interesting, if you go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Skip verse 13 and go to verse 14, where he says, forgive other people when they sin against you, your, your heavenly father forgives you. What was verse 13 that was skipped over? What's verse 13 that's couched between the forgiveness pieces? Well, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Could it be then that the greatest temptations of your life and mine are not to forgive? And not only not to forgive, but not to forgive in such a way that it gives a wide open door for the evil one in your mind and in your heart to make you toxic and bitter and angry and a slave of your own unforgiveness, the evil one. What is the, who is the evil one? First of all, notice how Jesus talks about the evil one. Jesus is telling us there is an evil one. There is a devil. There is the Satan. He's real. And he is about, Jesus said in John 10, to steal from you, to kill you, and destroy you. This is the evil one. I know when my kids were growing up, when I was growing up, whenever I heard the evil one and the devil and Satan and the demonic, I would, all, I would always think about the horror movies and the spinning heads and the, and the ghouls. That's not at all what this is. The evil one is a slanderer and an accuser. He slanders you to God and he slanders God to you. He accuses you to God, shame and guilt, and he accuses God to you. He's not good. He holds back on my happiness. All that's from the evil one. And if you are without Christ, that's all you get. You get shame and guilt. Only in Christ does he interfere with that voice. But also he is a liar and a deceiver. Jesus called the evil one the father of lies. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. That is stunning. He's a liar and a deceiver who comes to you as if he's truth, light. So if he can lie to you to make you feel a certain way or endorse your desires in a certain way or to follow some spirituality that feels just so true and right and keeps you from Christ, he won. He's a deceiver, he's a liar, and he masquerades as light. And Jesus is putting a warning out there, beware of him because he comes after you. He comes after the children of God to lie. So he says, then pray like this, lead us, Father, lead us not into temptation. Now, would that mean we're praying for him not to lead us into temptation because otherwise he would lead us into temptation? Not at all. And you always interpret scripture with scripture. So if you go to James chapter one, it says that God never tempts us. That's not his character. So what is he getting at here? Let me put it simply. It's understanding, Lord, yes, we have temptations all around us, but it's this prayer. Lord, I pray, please preserve me from the evil one's specific temptations that I cannot bear. Lord, protect me from the evil one's specific temptations to me that I just cannot bear. But first, as you pray that, do you even know what those temptations are in your life that you're unable to bear? Because we all have bents, we all have desires, we all have lusts that may be unique to us. As I heard one, said one time, opportunity knocks, but temptation leans on the doorbell. Do you know where he's tempting you? I bring this out often as a reminder of this fishing lure. And James actually talks about sin in terms of it, your desires being lured. So a fishing lure. So if you can make this out, you know, if you fish, this lure will repel some fish. It's not a big deal to them. Some fish will stop and stare and ponder, maybe nibble. But there are some fish who will run at it and grab it. Do you know what your specific lure is? Because what you got to remember, there's an evil one that has a hook behind it. And there's the hook. And so he's going to waggle the lure out there at your specific bents and desires and temptations to hook you, to drag you off, to steal from you, to kill you and destroy you, the evil one. 
Do you know what that is? And Jesus is saying, pray, pray, pray the Lord help you not to be lured by something that's unbearable and it's temptation. Okay, so that's God's part, but you know you got to do your part too, right? I got to do my part too. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, potentially by what you can't bear, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. <laughs> so that means you can't get to the cookie jar, put your hand in, grab three cookies and go, God, I'm being tempted beyond what I can bear. No, you got your hand in the cookie jar already and you're holding three cookies. And it's not that you got the jar, you keep walking by it, you know, looking at it. Lord, there's the cookie jar, I can't bear it. No, you need to keep the cookie jar out of your house. You need to take every means possible to keep the cookies far, far away. Yeah, because of the temptation. <laughs> I once heard it said that most people want to be delivered from their temptation. Most people want to be delivered from their temptation, but stay in touch. No, you don't want to stay in touch. Why? Because the Father says, pray to him. Because there are very real temptations the evil one's going to come after you about. That's not the... It's not to frighten you. It's to set you free. It's to say, God cares about what this is in my life, and I need to be praying about it, and I need to keep the cookies a far, far away from me. Yeah. So where are you most tempted? And often where you find yourself most tempted is where it most hurts to say no. I mean, if you really love cookies, and they're just right, and mm, I, oh, I miss that cookie. Yeah. That multiply that out to the sin, of course, and it hurts to say no, but you know there's a hook that's going to hurt worse. Hmm. So pray. How do we pray? Pray in relationship. Pray in reverence. Pray in surrender. That's God's concerns. Then pray your concerns. Pray for your needs. Pray for forgiveness. Pray for protection. You know, I got good news for you this week. You get not to play God isn't that good news? Because if you leave here and you go God being plan B, you're going to go right back to feeling crazy and anxious, stressed, worried, exhausted, afraid. But God says, no, no, no. Get your focus right. Pray to your Father who is in heaven, who is for you, and he loves you. Lord, thank you for this word. Yeah. Help our unbelief. Help our unbelief. And Lord, may we go today not just with a prayer in which to pray, but a life in which to live out through your prayer. We give you praise and glory. It's all about you, Jesus, and we pray it all in your name. And we all said, amen, amen. amen. So we're going we're gonna to close service with the opportunity to take communion together. And uh, if you got one of these, hopefully you got one of these when you walked in. If you're new to this, I encourage you to get that top layer going right away. So before, uh, before we do that, I always want to uh, remind us, ground us in why we're doing this. So maybe perhaps you're coming today and you're coming from a religious background and, and this just seems very normal, very traditional, something you just do regularly at the church. Or maybe you're brand new and what is going on in this place? So for wherever you're at on the spectrum, I want to ground us, remind us why are we doing this. So communion is a celebration of forgiveness that we have because of Jesus Christ. That's why we remember it. And it's important that we remember it often. So that's an individual response. Each person here in this place and all of you join us online, individually, what do you do with the gift of God in Jesus Christ? You've got two choices. Accept that, praise God, or reject that. Or maybe you're just kind of on the journey and you're asking the questions. So I'd say if, you, if, if, if you're... you're, if you're not there yet. We're glad you are here today and you're asking some very, the most important questions you could be asking. But there's really no reason for you to participate in communion because it's not yet a choice you've made. 
However, I would say, why not today? Why not respond to the gift of God through Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for your sin, God's love so clearly given through Jesus? Why not today and then celebrate with us? For us as believers, why do we do this regularly and why do we do this together? That's another aspect. We do it individually. My parents don't decide this for me. My pastor doesn't decide this for me. I alone stand before God. What did you do with the gift of God in Jesus Christ? So individually, but also as a church, because we walk into this place from all different places. What unites us is Jesus, that we all need a savior. We all need a rescue and that Jesus is the hope of the world. And so as a church, we're united in Jesus. So we do it together. We're in a moment, the band, they're just gonna play some music silently. Before they do that, just to prepare ourselves, Pastor Jared just set us up so beautifully. To de- you know, what, when we honor God's name, our heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. So we don't wanna make a mockery of God's name and what this means when we take communion. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm not going to say, God, thank you for forgiving all my sin. But then I'm intent as I leave this place to continue on in my sin. That's mocking God. And I got good news for you. Today, you can go to your heavenly father to confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. That we can go to God who loves us and say, God, I just got to bring this before you today with an honest and sincere heart and experience the forgiveness of God flow over you. But also, Pastor Jared talked about that other side of forgiveness today too. We use that word forgiveness and someone comes to your mind. And it's so hard, not just to forgive, but to keep forgiving that person. So let me encourage you as we just quietly, maybe it's just, you're gonna say maybe under your breath or before the Lord, I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to choose to forgive. And then by God's grace, he would empower you to live that out. So let's just be quiet before the Lord. Maybe it's a prayer. You pray to your heavenly father, and then we'll take communion together. moment is about you and celebrating your sacrifice for our sake, that you paid the price in full for our sins, and that was out of your love and out of your mercy, and then you lavish grace upon us, you adopt us, you claim us as your own. So Jesus, we praise you in this moment, for there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. So be be worshiped and be praised in this moment, Jesus. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Amen. Let's stand now as we continue to worship Jesus in his name. Thanks, Pastor Jim. As we go into this time of worship, let's glorify and magnify that holy name that hallowed name.
God, for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ, that we can go today to our Heavenly Father, that this is not the end of the conversation, but as we go from this place, we can be in an attitude, in a mindset of prayer that we can engage and have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Maybe you want somebody to pray with you, encourage you, we'd love that opportunity up front before you go today. Don't need to rush out. Connect with us on the cafe or stop by our info desk for more information. Before you all go, I want to pray for you one more time. Father, thank you for your word that it's a light unto our feet that guides us in steps of righteousness for our joy. So I pray as we go from this place, we are wise people, not just to hear, but to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.